what all of us look at rheumatic diseases, probably what Dr. Dharmanand spoke must be that it is, that it's only a painful condition, manage the pain and the disease in rheumatic disease, that's it. So that, that's all not what really it is. Rheumatic diseases often look quite benign, looks overtly there is nothing much more to do, but when it turns out and when it gets into a lot, lot of problems, really we, la we lot in much more than what is happening. See the basic issue when we come to the rheumatic diseases, there are quite a good number of diseases which will cause uh, a stormy damage to vital organs. In a sense, if you look into lupus, if you are not in time to make a diagnosis, the kidneys are knocked off. If you look at the lupus or a vasculitis involving the central nervous system, if you are not in time to intervene, he lands up with a hemiparesis. Left alone over a period of time takes the life off. So there are several systemic diseases in rheumatic diseases which can cause either an organ threatening or threatening to the life. In addition to that, we need to remember most of these rheumatic diseases are immune mediated diseases. We do use the drugs which alter these immune system. By handling or putting our foot into the immune system, we are literally deranging the system which otherwise would defend the entire body or try to put the system right in place. Because as I, was, as I repeatedly emphasize, as most of us are very clear, it's the immune system which tries to maintain the equilibrium, which is the immune system which tries to strike the balance between the invaders as well as its protection. It is the immune system which responds to injury to make things in a better shape. In a sense, this system is absolutely deranged either because of the disease or because of the drugs that we are using. That in turn results in a situation what we think is otherwise not an emergency as an emergency. To give a simple example, a minor urinary tract infection which could have been otherwise managed on an outpatient basis sometime may move into a sepsis within no time much before you realize. So in a sense, this altered immune system is another responsible factor for most of these patients landing up into one or the other emergencies. And sometime the manifestation could be very subtle, it could be too subtle to identify itself. A patient on immunosuppressive walks into your clinic, mild fever, you find him having a tachycardia which is disproportionate to the fever what you are recording, remember you are seeing a patient who needs an ICU maybe within 24 to 48 hours. What I mean here is, since his immune system is suppressed, the patient who is having a tachycardia disproportionate to what you can otherwise estimate is moving towards sepsis because of some infection somewhere. So in a sense, the manifestation could be so subtle which may make us to ignore. So if, if we are little careful, little uh, thought over on the problem that why is this particular manifestation is there, probably you should pick up an emergency much, much earlier than it really becomes a dare emergency. What the question that remains is how common is it? What, what is the incidence, what is the prevalence of the rheumatic diseases presenting in emergency? There are various data, of course, as usual, from India we have a very limited publication with reference to emergencies in rheumatic diseases. It's been estimated that 3 to 8 percent of the emergency room consultations are mainly because of rheumatic diseases. In a sense, every 3 to 8 patients in a 100 patients who visits an emergency room for various reasons could be because of a directly because of rheumatological diseases. If you include the patient who comes with other emergencies not directly connected to rheumatic diseases are indirectly connected to the rheumatic diseases like acute infections, associated comorbid conditions, are they developing complication to a simple insult or simple infections, it almost adds another 10 to 15 percent. In a sense, the patients suffering from rheumatic diseases also have higher comorbid conditions. The patients suffering from rheumatic diseases do have higher incidence of stroke, myocardial infarction and so on and so forth. Few of, few of our speakers subsequently are going to highlight on these issues. In a sense, the patient either 
because of rheumatic diseases may land into emergency or may because he has a rheumatic diseases may land into emergency for any other reasons. So I would like to look at these rheumatological emergencies into two separate subclasses. The first is the emergencies occurring as a consequence of rheumatic diseases directly. The most common are systemic lupus erythematosus and vasculitis which most of us are aware that can present with a lot of emergencies. The rheumatoid arthritis with a crisis especially like atlantoaxial subluxation or various vasculitis and other clinical manifestations, scleroderma crisis etc. There are quite a long list which I will be showing you just to highlight what are the likely probabilities because in 20 minutes assigned it is very difficult for me to go through the all these emergencies that are likely to happen. What I thought is I will just try to touch on and show you what are the likely probabilities with reference to emergencies so that we can keep our eye open. The second possibility is due to the drugs that we use in rheumatic diseases. It could be as plain a problem as NSAIDs what Dr. Dharmanand was speaking. It could land up with a intergastrointestinal bleed or it could land up with some other complication like perforation secondary to NSAIDs, bone marrow suppression, the variety of immunosuppressive drugs which we use. The second possibility is in a rheumatic disease patients in when he presents with a trauma, when he presents with an infection, when he presents with a myocardial infarction or stroke, we need to remember on the background he has a rheumatic diseases. We on the background he is on some or other drug to rheumatic diseases which needs a little bit change in the modification of the protocols of treatment that what we would otherwise follow up with the patients. So just to name a list, a true rheumatological emergencies could be an acute low back pain, acute gout, acute arthritis where patient may walk in with a severe excruciating pain to emergency room. Not really all of them may require an admission into emergency room but definitely they require an emergency look into their problem because pain is so severe, so acute, so distressing that the patient requires an immediate attention for the relief of the pain. The arthritis arising de novo should be taken as emergency as we put it because we believe that earlier we intervene with reference to rheumatoid arthritis, earlier we intervene with reference to infective arthritis, we are likely to have a better preserved joints. So it is always better to call it arthritis arising de novo for the first time as an emergency but of course it may not fall into the definition what we otherwise look as a medical emergencies but still if you go further we have acute exacerbation of patients with chronic arthritis especially what we call rheumatoid flare. The worst to come is like the lupus flares and systemic necrotizing vasculitis. They really require an admission, assessment, emergency to care so that you can conserve the organ whatever and whichever is it is threatening. The scleroderma in renal crisis, the patients of a scleroderma who is otherwise look benign, doing very well and present with gradual or a fast accelerating blood pressure. The blood pressure day one is 150-100, the second day he comes it is around shoots to 200 to 150, probably you are seeing a patient who are likely to land up in the renal crisis. Catastrophic antipospolipid syndrome is always a nightmare for all the emergencies. It is tough to decide whether the patient is of a sepsis, a patient is of an antipospolipid antibody syndrome or a vasculitis. It is always very difficult for us to make up a diagnosis. We do lost quite a bit of patients because of delay in making the diagnosis. Overall, even in the best experienced center where the investigation facilities are complete and do thoroughly, there also the catastrophic antipospolipid syndromes overall outcome has been put at a point of somewhere around 30 to 40 percent as a mortality because of antipospolipid antibody syndrome, mainly because of the delay in recognition. The delay in recognition is mainly because again that we never think of this as one of the possibilities when the patient present with those clinical manifestations. Intracranial bleed, in lupus nephritis with accelerated hypertension, seizures in systemic lupus erythematosus, cyclophosphamide when we treated we present with induced hemorrhagic cystitis, drug associated bone marrow suppression and so on. This, these are all the complications which could be directly matchable to the rheumatic diseases. 
few other conditions like tubercular meningitis in lupus. This is one of the very trickiest situation where we always land up in saying and getting in confusion whether it is a infective meningitis or whether it is lupus presenting with meningitis. Acute adrenal insufficiency due to mistaken withdrawal of the steroids either by patient or by the treating clinic uh, primary physician asking him to stop the steroids at once may land up in adrenal insufficiency in adrenal crisis. The infections of moderate to severe nature, even the moderate nature of infection should be treated as emergency especially in the patient on immunosuppression as I was trying to put across that the patient may land up in a severe sepsis within no time. NSAID induced complications and various other medical emergencies. Disease wise I just highlight so that I mean I am just trying to put it across basically to sensitize rather than putting it uh, I mean uh, going in details because in rheumatoid arthritis the most common problems that we take it as an emergency is the Atlanta axial dislocation. How early to identify, how quickly to identify a patient of a rheumatoid arthritis origin I mean rheumatoid arthritis 10 year and above if we present with a tingling sensation of both the arms or tingling sensation of the legs or the sort of a fa falling feeling when patient says that I suddenly feel as if I am jerked down or pushed down if those feelings are coming probably the patient is likely to land up with Atlanta axial dislocation if not attended early he may land up with quadriparesis and he needs a quick identification and attention because early fixation of this could really save him from quadriparesis or the sudden death which could otherwise happen. Sclerosis perforans is basically an emergency where you need to handle to salvage his eyes because there the patient's sclera may go for thinning out and sudden perforation could result in vision loss. The vasculitis most of the time are not a very serious emergencies with reference to rheumatoid associated vasculitis usually they produce more of ulcers sometimes can produce the toe threatening complications where a toe may go for a gangrene or infarcts. Acute exacerbation of synovitis, patients may be disabling, may require early interventions, but this need to be seriously differentiated from an infection into joint, an infective arthritis which should be seriously looked into and should be attended as an emergency. SLE is a nightmare for any of the rheumatologist. SLE is one condition where we always look upon the patient as any time a patient threatening to land up in emergency. I always explain to the patient, to the relative that SLE is like an, a bomb which is likely to explode where the wire length is not completely known. It could be several years or it could be just a few months because we do see a patient of an SLE whom we think is stable sent home and comes back within a few days with a lot of, a lot of complications. It could be like a seizures, he may come with psychosis, he may come with encephalopathy, he may have pericarditis, myocarditis, endocarditis with various symptoms, he may present with acute uh, respiratory decompensations, he may present with a rapidly progressing renal dysfunctions, may land with multiple vasculitis in various organs including CNS and various other sites, may present with hypertensive crisis, may present with pancreatitis and various polycerositis presenting with edema and of course not but not the least are the infections because this is one condition where we may land in finding a difficulty to differentiate what are we handling with. APL syndromes may present either with stroke, MI, renal vessel, or retinal vessels, thrombosis, pulmonary thromboembolisms and infarctions, thrombocytopenia with bleeding but this is unusual though they have thrombocytopenia, APL patients bleeding is rather unusual but still we need to keep think crash, placental ischemia and a fetal loss which should be taken as emergency because emergency is not to the mother but to the uh, child whom she is carrying, early quick intervention can still salvage the fetus and catastrophic APL syndrome is something which always scares us. Vasculitis could be isolated cerebral vasculitis or a systemic vasculitis with strokes, optic neuritis, uveitis is a vision threatening, mesenteric vasculitis is life threatening because an infarct, bowel infarct can patient present with acute abdomen, ileus and patient we find it very difficult to ascertain the reason sometime hypertensive crisis and a rapid progressing renal dysfunction. 
Various other minor systemic disorders like systemic sclerosis can present with digital vasculitis and ischemia, scleroderma renal crisis, inflammatory myositis, you should remember patient may land up right into a respiratory failure, crystal induced arthropathies, usually the acute gout pain, outpatient emergencies, but acute interstitial nephritis needs an inpatient care and further management. Septic arthritis needs a very quick identification when it's a single joint, badly flared joint <coughs> with temperature being raised, please remember to put a needle into the synovial joint, aspirate it to exclude a possible infection because that's one thing which we should never miss. Reactive arthritis may come with a crippling disease, patient may come as if the, all the joints are uh, not being mobilized, immobile and needs a quick attention. So with small dose of steroids, one can bring him back to normal. If what's the key point? I mean, just I, I, what, what I try to do to list such a long slides is basically to make us to remember that rheumatic diseases have a plenty of emergencies to be faced with. They exist. They are more commoner than what we are expecting. Most of the diseases, most of the patient where we have declared that we are not able to make an ascertain a diagnosis or a diagnosis that the death is because of a cardiorespiratory failure, probably we might have missed one such treatable rheumatic disease. The, what I am trying to say is please identify the disease. If not possible to identify, they can help to identify. Just a phone call to one of the rheumatologists should help them to give you a clue that probably this could be A, B, C, D, E. So that it helps us to put an eye into that. And we, we now know that probably it could be an SLE what I am looking in. See the, what I am trying to say, the patient brought into the emergency room as a uh, infection query, infection type or query typhoid fever. You see him, first time his creatinine was 0.5. Within three days, you are seeing his creatinine is 1.2. You are seeing his vidal is positive, but still it's not clinical features are not matching to a real typhoid disease. You have his pleural effusion, ascites which is detected by you, but the vidal report is positive. Now you are in a dilemma where, where are we and what are we? Probably what you are seeing is probably an SLE. Vidal test could be falsely positive in a person who has been exposed, vaccinated, or in most of these autoimmune disease because immune system is pouring out a lot of autoantibodies including rheumatoid factor and so on, the Vidal could be falsely positive. So that being the case, please remember at this point of time that there could be something more. So try to look into that, try to watch for that, probably you will be identifying a lupus much before the patient lands up into a permanent renal damage. So that, that's where what I am trying, trying to say is identify if not just take and help to identify because basically problem is the rheumatologist sometimes may be difficult to be sent, get an appointment or appointment. The best is a phone call to any one of us, we would be able to help you out to find out, figure out these are the possibilities. Just check out this. If these are not, probably I have no, of no help. You go ahead with treating it as a vital fear. See the most critical is to make that whether it is rheumatological or non-rheumatological. I will present to you a case in the case discussion in the second session end just to highlight how complex, how problematic sometimes we land up in making a reasonable decision to take and to reason, in spite of a reasonable decision what we think we may land in trouble. Because most critical here is the direction from treating an infection which is otherwise clinically manifesting like a rheumatological disease versus a rheumatological disease is in exactly in the opposite direction. You are likely to put an immunosuppressive therapy in contrary to an otherwise an infective condition. So you are literally pulling a patient if he is an infection out of him being alive to a death by putting an immunosuppressive. So you need to be very much clear that it's a rheumatological disease and that's a time when you decide you should put an immunosuppressive therapy including a very high dose steroids. This decision making is the one which is likely to pull out a patient off his deathbed or allow him, him to die because this is becomes too critical decision making with reference to this. There are a few simple investigations which can really help us. The most critical is usually C3 and C-reactive protein. Normal C3 or a low C3, CRP which is just one to one and a half times, 90% of the time the patient is likely to suffer from rheumatic diseases rather than infection. 10% is always a border fence where we may land up in trouble in making the decision because in any infections usually CRP rise more than five times, 
C3 also rise parallelly. Usually C3 is not consumed unless there is an immune complex comp Various viral infections can trigger naturally occurring autoantibodies. Epstein-Barr virus infection, cytomegalovirus infection, HSV group of infections which infects the B cells as a primary target or which stimulates the B cell as a primary target can generate a good number of these autoantibodies. They could be ANA positive, they could be anti-DS DNA positive, they could be PNK positive, rare, less, rare, relatively rarely CNK positive but it's not an exception. We can see sometimes even the positivity of all these uh, autoantibodies. So mere presence of autoantibodies is not adequate for us to tell that it could be an autoimmune disease. But you need to look at the clinical background, look at other parameters and autoantibodies as a supportive diagnosis to make an emergency decision. Sometime you may land up in giving handling an infection as well as an immunosuppressive. So but that's, that's a dare emergency because as we remember in emergency where you are inconclusive, where you feel it is a 50-50 is an option, one could be rheumatic disease, another could be an infection, handle both as a blanket management and then decide yourself that what is the likely possibility, pull out the other uh, option which is less likely or more or less not likely to be. The treatment protocol, I mean, it's, it's very difficult for me to give. I think if we have gone through any Could specific, you Could yeah, you that's the last slide, any specific protocol, there is no universal protocols, decision should be taken case by case. In a, it has to be individualized with each case. I always feel a multidisciplinary approach is the key to get a better result because more the heads are put in, in a difficult situation like this, more likely we are going to get a better deal in making a reasonable diagnosis. To make a diagnosis, a good physician with a sufficient knowledge should be the sheet anchor of managing most of these emergencies. He should be supported by a good input both from rheumatologists and other supportive uh, people so that we can reasonably land up in appropriate diagnosis, treatment and managing them. Thank you very much.